Hello and welcome. Uh, thank you for coming to this month's gallery talk here. Uh, my wife reminded me when I uh, left the apartment this morning that the essence of a good introduction is to get up and get out of the way. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to do and turn it right over to Rebecca to give us an insight into aspects of the careers of Van Gogh and Lawrence that are a bit unusual. But before I do that, I do want to mention also that a week from now, uh, the 30th, Rebecca will be back here doing another talk, this one on Perugino, the Italian Renaissance artist, uh, and this will be sponsored by the Seattle P Perugia uh, Sister City Committee and the art, our art committee here. So we will welcome all of you to that and hope that you will be able to attend that. And now I'm going to follow my own advice, and here's Rebecca. Yeah. And that um, the Perugino lecture will be at 7 p.m., uh, so a different time. But I do hope to see as many of you as possible there. <coughs> If the average person knows one thing about Vincent Van Gogh, it's that he went crazy and cut off his own ear. Most people with even a passing familiarity with Van Gogh realize that he spent time in a hospital for the mentally ill, although they may be surprised to know how many of his most famous works were completed there. The ravishing irises from uh, really one of the first images he made of his new surroundings. The wheat field with cypresses as he explored the area around the asylum and most famously of all, the starry night which for Van Gogh was a failure of a painting uh, and is an image that has prompted some scholars to say that clearly this was the product of a schizophrenic mind and for others to say that it's the result of the most profound and moving clarity of thought. <laughs> Exactly what Van Gogh suffered from, we do not know, however. There are a vast variety of diagnoses. Schizophrenia, lead poisoning, acute intermittent porphyria, tertiary syphilis, absinthe poisoning, epilepsy, Meniere's disease. Uh, the most likely candidate is a mixed form of bipolar disorder, which accounts best for the cyclical nature of his psychotic attacks and the fact that he could not paint while in the grip of his indispositions, as he called them, but had periods of intense productivity in between his attacks of illness. However, even among people who are familiar with Jacob Lawrence's art, very few realize that like Van Gogh, in his 30s, Jacob Lawrence sought treatment in a mental hospital for nearly a year. Uh, his diagnosis is secure. It was major depression. So what I'd like to do today is to examine their experiences within the walls of their respective asylums, what they sought there, what they found, and how they depicted those experiences. Uh, Vincent van Gogh became sick while in Arles. Um, living with Gauguin, and a new theory has it that it was Gauguin's fencing swords. Gauguin himself, who may have struck off Van Gogh's ear. Um, however, it certainly 
is a fact that it was while Van Gogh was in the throes of a psychotic event, uh, and he did wrap that ear up and present it to a prostitute in a local brothel. He was hospitalized, he recovered, he was released, uh, then he had another episode, and his neighbors signed a, peti a petition stating that he was dangerous. They wanted him locked up. So he was involuntarily committed to Arl Hospital, um, to uh, this ward that we see with the nuns, with the um, uh, the hangings, uh, not individual rooms at all, uh, but it was intolerable to Van Gogh to have lost the trust of his community that he had built up for a year in Arl. And like his neighbors, he too felt tremendous fear that he could potentially be a danger to those around him, particularly were he to return to Paris to live with his beloved brother Theo, or Theo. So he chose to seek out an establishment that could care for him. And he picked this one, the House of Health of Saint-Rémy de Provence. Uh, it had been a, a hospital since the 17th century. It was originally a monastery, uh, and we see here a poster for it uh, from the late 19th century, contemporary to Vincent's stay there, uh, and a photograph of Vincent's room. Um, however, since the hospital was not full, he was allowed to have two rooms. One with his bed and a chair, a place for him to sleep, and one as a studio, a place for him to paint. And at first he painted within the walls of his room and within the former monastery garden, uh, writing to Teo, quote, yesterday I drew a large, rather rare, night moth, which is called the death's head. Its coloration astonishingly distinguished. Black, gray, white, shaded, and with glints of carmine, or vaguely tending towards olive green, end quote. So he first drew and then painted it. But it's interesting that he considered it a death's head moth and symbols of death will recur in his work uh, at San Remy. Um, he painted fragile things when he entered the asylum, as he must have felt himself fragile. But the most important thing that he sought out there was contact with nature. And there was an overgrown convent garden uh, where the patients were encouraged to sit and to stroll. And Vincent made a number of images in that garden, finding the moth there and the poppies, uh, the irises that we've already seen. Uh, but in this study of the uh, lilac bush, you can see the irises here in the corner and over here. Um, so he is within the walls, you can see the wall there at the very right, of his new establishment. And the motif of the wall is not one that occurred in Van Gogh's art until this time. So this is the view from the window of his studio of an enclosed field. Again, that wall with such an important uh, impact on the composition. And this is the first time in his life that he has been locked up. 
within walls. Um, so he paints this enclosed wheat field filled with spring wheat uh, in May or June. It was, it was May that he um, entered the asylum and it had to have been just a few weeks later that he painted the scene again. It's hard to imagine that the wheat had changed that much in just a few weeks, uh, but it has taken on that swirling quality, so characteristic of the San Remy work that we see especially in Starry Night. Uh, but then, a few months later, when the wheat field began to turn gold, um, he wrote to uh, Theo on September 6, 1889, quote, Work is going quite well. I'm struggling with a canvas begun a few days before my indisposition, another attack he had had in July. A reaper. The study is all yellow terribly thickly impastoed, but the subject was beautiful and simple. I saw in this reaper a vague figure struggling like a devil in the full heat of the day to reach the end of his toil. I then saw the image of death in it, in this sense that humanity would be the wheat being reaped. So if you like, it's the opposite of that sower I tried before. But in this death, nothing sad. It takes place in broad daylight with a sun that floods everything with a light of fine gold. Uh, I could almost believe that I have a new period of clarity ahead of me." End quote. So he had been seriously thrown by that July attack. Uh, because it happened in the asylum. It happened when he was away from the pressures of society in Arles. He was away from his habitual diet of coffee and alcohol and very little else. Uh, and he still had another attack. Uh, a few weeks later, he made this prophetic comment in a letter to Theo, um, quote, I can see myself already in advance on the day when I have some success, longing for my solitude and my distress here, when I see the reaper in the field below through the iron bars of the isolation cell." End quote. This was made from his studio window, but uh, before long he was allowed a chaperone, an attendant from the hospital um, who took him on forays farther afield where he discovered the cypresses uh, that he called as beautiful of line and proportion as an Egyptian obelisk. Uh, they captivated and challenged the artist. Um, he, he wrote to Teo that um, uh, it is a splash of black in a sunny landscape, but is one of the most interesting black notes and the most difficult to hit off exactly that I can imagine." End quote. So he would go on excursions, he spent time in the garden studying the pine trees, um, often those with ivy on them. And that ivy is a twofold symbol. In 17th century Dutch emblem books, it stands for love, fidelity, love that even outlasts death. And yet that ivy is also choking the tree, eventually killing it. So it has positive and negative ramifications. Uh, his sister-in-law, when she saw this work, which he was proud of and allowed to be exhibited in Paris, um, she admired the cool solace of the shady grove, um, but perhaps 
and didn't feel the claustrophobic quality of all of that uh, ivy, all of those entangling vines. Uh, so after that attack, he didn't leave the asylum for some time, and one of the things that coaxed him back into the open was the autumn colors. He made a number of sketches of the russets, the yellows, the oranges, and he uh, wrote to his sister Will, or Wilhelmina, that this yellow mulberry tree was the best of them. So he considered these works sketches. Um, and at this point in his career, he was trying to clarify for himself um, what he considered a sketch and what he considered a tableau, a more important painting. So something like this that is done quickly on the spot, he felt was less important than the things that he, he thought about, uh, considered, maybe painted from imagination. Um, works like Starry Night. Uh, but he was increasingly attracted to wounded trees. This was a large tree within the garden of St. Paul that had been decapitated at some point. You can see the, um, the stump there. And uh, here in Pine Trees at Sunset, again we find um, that um, tree, uh, several trees that have lost their branches. He said that this is an image of the Mistral, that ferocious Provencal wind. Uh, and the woman is, is hurrying home and grasping her headscarf uh, to keep it from blowing off. And there's this sense of fragility and vulnerability in those branches, the wind so strong that they are breaking. He began to paint a series of olive trees about a month after moving to the asylum. And uh, this was a subject he found very compelling. Um, he uh, wrote to his brother Theo that he was, um, quote, struggling to catch the olive trees. They are old silver. Sometimes with more blue in them, sometimes greenish, bronzed, fading white, above a soil which is yellow, pink, violet, tinted orange. Very difficult, end quote. Uh, so these uh, works were more sketches. Uh, these images of olive groves, this one that includes a path and some brilliant red flowers that lead our eye into those silvery depths of the olives. Um, but this one was a tableau. In fact, he considered this the pendant for Starry Night, um, a daytime work to its nocturne. It has some of the same swirling movement in the ground, the olive trees, the rock formations. Um, and one of the reasons that propelled his interest in the olive trees was the fact that his friends Paul Gauguin and Emile Bernard were both working on paintings of Christ in the Garden of Olives. Van Gogh had attempted to paint this subject twice in Arles and abandoned uh, both attempts, which seemed to cause Van Gogh emotional turmoil. Uh, he felt his friends were going backwards in art by painting this devotional motif, uh, this scene from the Christian Gospels, uh, Van Gogh wanted to get the same feeling from the harvest. Uh, writing to uh, Theo in December 1889, quote, if I remain here, I wouldn't try to paint a Christ in the Garden of Olives, but in fact, the olive picking as it still seen today. 
um, that would perhaps make people think of it all the same, end quote. Uh, so this is an all of harvest without human figures in uh, November, but surrounding the trees are the nets or sacking uh, that were part of the harvest. The trees would be shaken to bring down the olives and then collected in that sacking. Except that the foreground tree, which does have a net, seems to be only a stump. Um, and may be a stand-in for Van Gogh himself and his cracked mind, as he called it in letters to his siblings. Uh, he did paint an olive harvest with figures, several of them in fact. Uh, this one is another tableau, not a sketch. Uh, and he sent this painting to his mother and sister, hoping that it would console them for the loss of his younger brother, uh, who was leaving their household to join the army. His major goal in the now nearly 10 years that he had devoted to being an artist was to create art that would be consoling. Not specifically religious, because by this time he has lost his faith in the literal Christian religion of his strict Calvinist upbringing, but he still wanted art that would comfort, like the biblical stories of his childhood did for him. But sometimes while at San Remy, he was almost afraid to leave his room. Um, and the psychotic crises that he had there were religious in nature, something that had already been noticed by Theo after his very first attack in Arles. Uh, Theo described his brother as incoherently spouting philosophy and theology in the wake of that uh, illness. But Vincent worried that the cloisters themselves were contributing to his illness, this former monastic environment. Um, writing uh, to uh, Theo, quote, um, when I see that crises here tend to take an absurd religious turn, I would almost dare believe that this even necessitates a return to the north. I don't know if this comes from livings for so many months, both at the hospital in Arles and here in these old cloisters." End quote. Uh, he wrote to uh, Will in September 1889, the weather outside has been splendid for a very long time, but I haven't left my room for two months. I don't know why. I would need courage, and I often lack it. And it's also that since my illness, the feeling of loneliness takes hold of me in the field in such a fearsome way that I hesitate to go out." End quote. Well, uh, as we saw, the fall colors did tempt him out by October. Um, and he was allowed to return to the countryside attended by one of the attendants of the hospital. Um, so he painted this ravine, uh, an image in which the whole ground seems to be buckling. Nowhere seems stable in this image, even though it is geologic. It, it should be as solid as a rock. Um, if we look carefully, we can find that there are two figures in the center, one there and one there, um, gray as stone, struggling over what seems to be a natural stone bridge. Uh, he also painted that fall in the town of Saint-Rémy, uh, 
So that was the closest community to the hospital. It was where Vincent went to pick up his mail, uh, the art supplies that his brother sent him. And it was there that he painted these road menders in the center of the canvas. But this is another image of geological turmoil. Uh, the earth seems to be boiling up around the roots of the trees, uh, and the road is being mended with long rectangular rocks that bear a resemblance to coffins. Now, Van Gogh felt that um, portraiture was the highest goal of his art. But he lacked access to models in Saint Remy. And he turned to his own image only twice in September of 1889, in those, those days when he was still confining himself to his room. And this one is somber and telling. Um, instead of giving us his studio as a backdrop, and you might remember in the image of uh, himself with a bandaged ear, there was a Japanese print hanging behind him. Um, here, he turns the background into this spiral pattern that we saw in the wheat fields, the olive groves, the starry night, um, creating this almost mystical seeming ice blue miasma. Um, and his face is drawn. Uh, there are dark greenish circles under his eyes. It has the ashen color of uh, the silver olive leaves or the rocks of the ravine. He did paint portraits of the hospital attendant and his wife. Uh, this is the orderly, uh, Trabuc. Um, and that word orderly could be the adjective to describe this man. Uh, that pinstriped suit gives us a taste of his preference for precision and order and discipline. It was Trabuc who was responsible for making sure the inmates got through their daily rounds, which were not particularly um, uh, filled with activity at all. Uh, they had to do hydrotherapy baths for two hours twice a week. They had meals at prescribed times, and the cloister bells that used to call the monks to prayer uh, would ring for the patients to come to mealtime, um, and they encouraged the inmates to walk in the gardens but there were no scheduled activities. There were no lectures. There were no art classes. Uh, they, uh, the patients were mostly completely idle. Uh, and um, yet, Vincent felt he learned from his proximity to those patients. Writing to Theo, quote, the fear of madness passes from me considerably upon seeing from close at hand those who are affected with it, as I may very easily be in the future. Before, I had some repulsion for these beings, and it was something distressing for me to have to reflect that so many people of our profession had ended up like that. Well, now I think of all this without fear, for although there are some who howl or rave, here there is much true friendship that they have for each other. If someone has some crisis, the others intervene so that he doesn't harm himself. I'm grateful for yet another thing. I observe in others that, like me, they too have heard sounds and strange voices during their crises, that things have also appeared to change before their eyes. And that softens the horror that I retained at first of the crisis I had. 
Once one knows that it's part of the illness, one takes it like other things. Had I not seen other mad people, I wouldn't have been able to rid myself of thinking about it all the time." End quote. So the knowledge that his visual and auditory hallucinations were not unique to him was immensely comforting to Vincent. And uh, in this painting, the smears of paint around the crown of the head of this patient suggest that he too is in the grip of some kind of lack of mental clarity, but it no longer frightens Van Gogh. But most of the time, he was alone. The other patients didn't care for painting or for long, impassioned discussions about art, which was what um, Vincent loved dearly. And Vincent even wrote to Teo that he thought it might be better to be in an institution where they made the patients work, made them toil in the fields during the day, uh, instead of leaving them completely idle. In September, he had an accident with one of his um, engravings in his collection. His Delacroix Pieta fell into his paints and got partly ruined. Uh, and at the right, you see the actual engraving that fell into the paint and, and where uh, the damage was. Uh, it's still in the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. Uh, so what Vincent did, and this was still um, after that July crisis when he's not going out, uh, he began to paint that pieta so that he would have an unmarred image of it. And he found the process uh, in which he gives Jesus a red beard rather like his, uh, he found the process consoling challenging and exciting for him. So he asked his brother to send more prints. He considered this kind of work an exercise. He describes it as like a conductor conducting Mozart or Beethoven, not playing his own notes, but his interpretation of those notes. Um, here, um, he painted a contemporary work of art. He only had a, a photograph here of this, so he didn't know the colors, and that's true of all of these. Uh, but this is a painting by Virginie uh, de Montbreton, the daughter of Jules Breton. Her man is at sea, uh, of a woman uh, at a hearth cradling her baby, thinking of her absent um, uh, husband. And uh, this was dangerous emotional territory for Vincent. It was precisely when he had been working on this painting of his friend Augustine Roulin in Arles, rocking her baby's cradle, that loop of um, rope uh, in her lap is attached to the cradle. It's, it what rock, it's what rocks it back and forth. It was precisely when he was working on this, that um, this image that he meant as a consoling image for sailors in their cabins at sea, that he suffered that first devastating psychotic attack. Um, but it may have been news of his sister-in-law's pregnancy that stirred him into producing images along this line to see if he could handle the subject matter, mentally and emotionally. Um, he, in fact, um, in, in painting this evening, uh, after a series that Mie made of the times of day, um, recommended Mie's engraving uh, to his pregnant sister-in-law, Joe. 
Um, also from the times of day uh, going out to work, he copied this um, etching. So again, he just knows the black and white, and he is translating them into much more brilliant colors than Millet ever used. But Millet was perhaps the single artist that Van Gogh loved most uh, for the truth to life of his images of the peasantry uh, and for the emotional resonance of his works. The baby was born healthy uh, in January. And Van Gogh would paint a copy of this Millet first steps of a father or perhaps an uncle joyfully opening his arms to welcome a baby learning to walk. Now, at this point, not only had Van Gogh not seen this nephew, but he had never even met Theo's wife, Jo, although he carried on a lively correspondence with both of them. And he was very excited about the birth of their child. Uh, but this may have provoked another attack. Um, he had been painting this image in February of Newgate Prison. Uh, from a Gustave Doré uh, engraving and may have imagined himself as a prisoner senselessly marching around in a circle uh, in captivity with protection but no stimulation. Uh, but it was this work, perhaps my favorite Van Gogh, uh, that he was painting for the baby's nursery, Almond Blossom. Um, and he wrote to Theo um, on March 17th, quote, work was going well. The last canvas of the branches in blossom, you'll see that it was perhaps the most patiently worked, best thing I had done, painted with calm and a greater sureness of touch, and the next day, done for like a brute. Difficult to understand things like that, but alas, that's how it is. I have a great desire to get back to my work, though. Perhaps days of serenity will return for me, too." End quote. This one was his most devastating spell, this February 1891, that took him the longest to recover from. And in addition to the baby, the other stressor weighing on him was that he had begun to garner critical attention for works on view in Paris, and he even sent a work to an exhibition in Brussels, a juried show where he made his only real sale, selling the Red Vineyard uh, to a woman artist for 400 francs. Um, during the time of his recovery, he made some uh, works from memory like these peasants digging in the snow who look like they've been transplanted from Van Gogh's northern homeland. Uh, he even began doing memory images of his own compositions, like the potato eaters of five years earlier, uh, which he still considered his most significant canvas. But he was highly embarrassed by the critical attention. It really threw him. Uh, it caused him great distress, as in fact he had predicted um, months earlier when he was painting that yellow reaper. Uh, so although he, um, he took this image from uh, the, the previous year, and touched it up, adding the two women in the foreground uh, to send to the critic Albert Aurier, who had written a glowing article about his work. He wrote to Theo um, 
on April 29, 1890, quote, please ask Mr. Aurier not to write any more articles about my painting. Tell him earnestly that first he is wrong about me, then that I really feel too damaged by grief to be able to face up to publicity. Making paintings distracts me. But if I hear talk of them, that pains me more than he knows." End quote. Uh, he um, was moving towards being released from the hospital uh, and um, took this etching that he had of Rembrandt's raising of Lazarus. And, um, Van Gogh's first job had been in an art dealership where he sold high quality reproductions of works, you know, prints by great artists like Rembrandt. Uh, and he had, he had his own small collection of them. So he took just this portion here, just this bit here, um, and um, painted the raising of Lazarus, where it is Lazarus this time, who has his own features, his own reddish beard. Um, but in fact, um, he was going to be released, which felt for him a bit like emerging from the tomb. Um, and he wrote to his brother in May 1890, quote, uh, you propose coming back to the North, and I accept. I've had too hard a life to kick the bucket as a result, or to lose the power to work. Oh, if I'd been able to work without this bloody illness, how many things I could have done, isolated from the others, according to what the land would tell me. But yes, this journey is well and truly finished, meaning his sojourn in the South. Anyway, what consoles me is the great, the very great desire that I have to see you again. You, your wife and your child and so many friends who have remembered me in my misfortune. I'm almost sure that I'll soon get better in the North, at least for quite a long time while still apprehensive of a relapse uh, in a few years' time, but not immediately. That's what I imagine. Anyway, what do we know about it?" End quote. So, in May 1890, he left San Remy in full hope of a lengthy remission from his illness, uh, in a period of serenity. So we know that it would only last for a couple of months and that his life would be cut short just uh, the following July uh, from a gunshot wound. But he painted these stunning works in that time. In 1950, Sixty years after Van Gogh was released from St. Paul's Hospital, an article in the New York Times Magazine began, quote, Only once since Vincent Van Gogh worked in the asylum at San Remy has an artist of reputation painted the inside of a mental institution. He is Jacob Lawrence a 33-year-old American painter whose work has multiplied eight times in price in the past 10 years and is owned by such diverse collectors as the Metropolitan Museum, Nelson Rockefeller, and Harpo Marx." End quote. <laughs> Lawrence had initially gained considerable acclaim nearly a decade earlier for his powerful 60-panel series, The Migration of the Negro, now known as the Migration Series, which was purchased in 1942 
when Lawrence was still 24 by jointly by the Museum of Modern Art in New York City and the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C. By 1949, Jacob Lawrence was unquestionably the most successful black artist in America. He had received prestigious fellowships and residencies, was showing regularly at museums, and was a darling of the critics. He was represented by Edith Halpert's downtown gallery, and three years later would be grouped with her old timers, like Ben Sean and Stuart Davis, uh, in a feature in Life magazine. When his war series was shown at Museum of Modern Art in December 1947, Time magazine called it, by far, his best work yet. This was based on his own service in the Coast Guard, which was shattering. His remark four decades later could serve as a caption for this painting, quote, I was on a troop transport ship which was a very sad experience. We would go overseas carrying 5,000 troops, and we would come back a hospital ship. I'll always remember the physical and psychological damage." End quote. And in 1949, Lawrence was facing the fallout of his own psychological damage. Success had come too easily for him, perhaps, leaving him with profound feelings of unworthiness and self-doubt. He felt he had merely been lucky. In this image from 1949, he paints three young men folding paper boats, a kind of metaphor for the artistic process but there's nowhere for them to float them. They are you know, sitting at the gutter. And yes, the late 1940s were a terrible time to be African American in the United States. After serving valiantly in World War II, after working um, in the factories that had been vacated by so many white men who had gone overseas, uh, they were hoping for better from their society, for some kind of recognition and betterment of their position, and found doors slammed shut again after those troops returned and society went back to a post-war normal. So in July 1949, Jacob Lawrence checked himself in to Hillside Hospital in Queens for treatment for major depression, an illness he depicted in this image, where we see some of the other inhabitants of the hospital shuffling by. The one on the left is trying, perhaps, he's, he's done a comb over. He's still got some vanity. Um, but then we have two with their heads hung. Um, the one on the right has not even bothered to get dressed. Uh, he's still in pajamas and slippers. But this man back here, whose feet we see, has not even gotten out of bed. Uh, in the next room, there is an old Jewish man reading a holy book. And beside him, on the, um, on the dresser, there is a bright yellow flower. One instance of hopefulness among these pea-green institutional walls. Now, Lawrence had painted hospitals before, most notably Harlem's Free Clinic. Uh, but those scenes are burgeoning with people of every shade of brown. They are crowded, noisy images, whereas Hillside was inhabited only by whites. Uh, Lawrence was the only black patient there due to uh, help 
from his gallerist. Edith Halpert paid his medical costs, uh, paid for his painting supplies, helped Gwen Knight Lawrence find work with Condé Nast Publishing um, to get them through this difficult period. Uh, now, in 1950, pharmacology did not have a lot to offer the mental patient. Lithium was just being discovered. It was tested literally in guinea pigs uh, for the first time in 1948 um, and would prove effective for manic depression. It might have helped Vincent tremendously. Uh, new medications for schizophrenia and depression were in the pipeline, but they had not come to market yet. So, the psychiatric profession was not yet in that age of psychopharmacology that we are still in, and what they had to offer was mainly sedation, the title of this painting. Lawrence paints the bright and shiny pills, planting them um, like so many primary colored gems on a white linen cloth, almost an altar cloth there in the foreground. And he shows how eager the patients are to grasp at this solution, um, at sedation, uh, to wipe out the pain of their experience. But Hillside had other kinds of therapy. First of all, it had talk therapy. Between 1890 and 1950, Sigmund Freud had revolutionized the field of psychology uh, with psychotherapy. Uh, and so something that Vincent did not have access to was the cathartic process of, of talk therapy therapy, Psyche, uh, you know, a, a caring psychiatrist that we see on the left who is hearing uh, the pain of the patient on the right as he relates his distress. Um, and it's unclear what the thing in the background is, some sort of very colorful Rorschach test or uh, something. Um, it's hard to know what's going on here, but what is important here is the relationship. Um, and Lawrence gave this drawing to his own psychiatrist. Uh, in this, um, we see the, the psychiatrist as an island of compassion, as the patient who we see only the tiniest slice of the features of um, is relating their experiences, their pain, their trauma, uh, relating it in a way that will hopefully be healing. But there were other kinds of therapy at Hillside. There was occupational therapy. Um, and the woman at the right uh, is the equivalent of the man that was still in his pajamas. Because as much as nowadays young women walk around all the time and even go to work with their bra straps showing, in 1950, that was a sign of mental illness. Um, she's doing bright embroidery work. Uh, there are others doing needlework, a woman at a sewing machine in the background. Um, and uh, here in the weaving studio in occupational therapy number two, um, we get the sense that it's the depressive patients in the background who are bent over their work and the manic patients in the foreground who are playing cat's cradle with their balls of wool. Uh, but all of this is allowing them to channel some of their misery into productive pursuits. There were concerts held for the patients 
Although this one may not have been terribly successful, uh, Lawrence paints the performer from the back, and we see her, uh, her asymmetrical ball gown and her coiffure. Um, but if we look at her audience, there is very little in the way of joy or rapture on the faces of the um, patients. Uh, the square dancing was perhaps more successful as it got the patients bodily involved in the music. Uh, it's now known that exercise is antidepressant um, and uh, as they swirl around the room there actually begin to be smiles on a few of the faces and then of course there was creative therapy uh, and here Lawrence inserts a sly self portrait he is the brown figure at work at his easel. Uh, there's a man in the foreground painting a still life, another working on a painting of chess pieces, uh, perhaps another occupation there. Uh, but the painting that he might be at work on um, may be this painting, which is on his easel in this photograph by Sid Bernstein of uh, Lawrence <coughs> at work on the hospital paintings at Hillside Hospital uh, in 1950. Uh, now, this painting, oops, wrong way. Um, this painting um, cannot be located, it's lost. It was photographed in 1950, um, and it looks like there's chess being played, and cards being played, and perhaps dancing in the background. Um, but uh, unfortunately, it, it hasn't been seen for 70 years. Um, but um, it's here in this photograph. And so Lawrence would stay first for four months, from July to November of 1949. He was home for the holidays, but as his depression proved intractable, he re-entered the hospital on January 16th of 1950 and stayed there until August, a total of 11 months. Um, what Lawrence said he found particularly energizing for him was working in the garden, saying, quote, it was exciting for me to do gardening. It was the first time I lived in the country. I didn't make any sketches. I remember the feeling of it, and I tried to get that feeling in here." End quote. And he certainly gets the feeling of the greenness, the colors, the earth itself, all helping with his healing. But we also see <laughs> that fellowship is part of the process as well. Um, which was what Van Gogh did not find at the hospital in San Remy. And I want to read a quote from Lawrence's psychiatrist about the 11 paintings that he made in the hospital. Emmanuel Klein said, quote, Unlike Van Gogh, Lawrence simply had nervous difficulties, neither particularly complicated nor unique, which became so much of a burden that he voluntarily sought help. These paintings did not come from his temporary illness, as they always have, and is, as is true for most real artists. The paintings express the healthiest portion of his personality, the part that is in close touch, both with the inner depths of his own feelings and with the outer world, end quote. And that is what Lawrence is able to communicate in these hospital images, showing the healing capacity of nature, of the outdoors, and of working communally on creative pursuits. Perhaps Vincent was correct in saying that he would have done better 
in an institution that forced its patients to toil in the field uh, rather than um, experiencing enforced idleness. Jacob Lawrence found a caring staff implementing the most up-to-date programs to aid in patients' healing, from talk therapy to work therapy to square dancing. Van Gogh found solitude and structure, uh, but the laissez-faire atmosphere did not provide the social stimulation he craved. And perhaps even 60 years later, Hillside could have done little to prevent the violence of his recurring bipolar attacks. Uh, but Van Gogh realized that this solitude was oppressive, as did Jacob Lawrence, when commissioned to depict a related theme shortly after his release from the hospital, the dilemma of an aging population, he chose to portray a man playing solitaire. <coughs> Now, an interviewer commented that his hospital series, with its well-off but abject white people, was a major departure from his usual themes of civil rights and emancipation. But Jacob Lawrence had been there and experienced it from the inside, and he disagreed. His hospital series, he said, was absolutely of a piece with the rest of his work, as he put it, quote, because it still says struggle, doesn't it? End quote. Thank you. Questions? Uh, images you'd like a second look at? Um, yes. Uh, there's one hand down there, the far end. <laughs> Thank you. Good. It's interesting that almost all of your slides of Van Gogh were in 1989, plus or minus several months. And that was because, even though he had bipolar disorder, there were variations in, within an individual in their bipolar qualities, and he, at that time, was what is known as hypomanic, meaning he, very he, productive. he was very outgoing, manic -y, but not overboard. And it's interesting that K. Redfield Jameson is one of the leading writers, and she herself had bipolar disorder. Uh, and she, among her books, in which she describes her manias, she also has a book on the creativity of artists and writers, maybe 15 or 20, one of whom is Van Gogh. Yes. And she makes the point that these people can be extremely creative at the periods in their condition when they're not, quote, crazy, but they're just full of energy. Yes. For a very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, and uh, that, that fire is one of the words in the title of that K. Redfield Jameson book. The, the entire title isn't coming to me, but it is an excellent book. She talks about Byron. She talks about Van Gogh. Um, and and other figures and 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 we have this idea that the work comes out of the madness and she absolutely dispels that she said you you cannot work and Van Gogh could not work when he was in the grip when he, when he was spouting incoherently philosophy and theology he was not painting he was not able to paint uh, but yes when he was hypomanic, he had energy, um, he painted a great deal. Uh, but really, when we think about Van Gogh, we are thinking about three years, really. 87, 88, 89, the first half of 1890. Um, the, that's 
The period when Van Gogh is painting those brilliant colors, particularly after he moves to Arles um, in, I think, early 1888. So Van Gogh's output was tremendous. He died at 37. And, um, and Jacob Lawrence was 32 when he injured Hillside. And, and we're so lucky that he had that opportunity. Um, that because if he had not had gallery representation, yes, there were mental hospitals for black Americans, but they didn't have square dancing. And um, they didn't have nice gardens to work in. And, um, and, and they might not have been nearly as... Um, satisfactory as places for him. Um, so he, he would go on, of course, to have a very long and productive career. Um, but yes, the, the, the madness is, is not when Van Gogh could paint. Um, yes? And my second career was as a psychotherapist. And I had one patient that I really enjoyed and she had schizophrenia, and she was treated with a medication that she said it was good for her, but she hated her medication because she could not paint. Mm. And finally, long after I had gone somewhere else, she got off her medications, and she painted and then killed herself. Uh, so Van Gogh was killed by a gun shot? Oh. So the story of Van Gogh's death is not completely clear. Um, he, he was long believed to have killed himself, but you know, such a screw up, he couldn't even do that right. Now he shot himself in the abdomen and took a couple of days to die of the wound, and um, uh, it was quite awful. And there is some new evidence from a, a recent-ish Van Gogh biography um, that it may not have been self-inflicted. Uh, there were a couple of boys in the town, Auvers-sur-Oise, where Van Gogh had gone to recuperate after San Remy. Um, and to live, and they teased Van Gogh mercilessly, and they are known to have played cowboy with a revolver. Uh, the, the gun that killed Van Gogh was never found, and he made the remark, don't blame anyone for this when he was in his final illness. Which is an odd thing to say if you've shot yourself. But this, this don't blame anyone else. So it's thought that perhaps it was a terrible accident. It was you know, that some situation that escalated um, and, and that the boys panicked and threw the gun in the river. Um, they, they made some comments much, you know, many, many years later in their lives that suggested guilt over Van Gogh's death. Um, whatever it was, whether it was suicide or uh, you know, homicide, or, it was a tragic accident. It cut short the, the life of a brilliant artist who had hoped when he left San Remy to have a number of years of productive work still in, ahead of him, not a number of weeks. Um, but unfortunately, that was not the case. Uh, other questions? I don't see any. Thank you all so much. to Tuesday evening um, I, when I will be lecturing on Italian Renaissance art, which is actually my own field. Uh, so that's always fun. You speak so beautifully. Oh, thank you.